The Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Now, before we get started, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Kelly Barnhill is the director of the Nutrition Clinic at the Johnson Center for Child Health and Development. She's a certified clinical nutritionist with over a decade of experience working with nutrition in children with autism and related disorders. At the Johnson Center, she directs a team of dietitians and nutritionists that has served more than 3,000 children through the practice. In addition to her clinical practice, Kelly also serves as the Johnson Center Clinical Care Director, overseeing management and implementation of multidisciplinary care across the practices within the organization. In 2008, Kelly accepted the position of Nutrition Coordinator for the Autism Research Institute. In this role, she designs and manages curriculum and training for nutrition practitioners and parents. Kelly is a sought-after presenter, speaking at several national and international conferences each year. These webinars are made possible through generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website at autism.com. And now I'll turn it over to Kelly. Thanks, Denise. Um, thank you all for joining us. I look forward to spending a little bit of time talking today about thinking about diet and nutrition as you head into the school year. And really my goals and objectives are pretty finite because I feel like there's a lot to cover. Um, first I want to talk about meals and meal planning success for the school year. Thinking about breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks um, across days, weeks, weeks, the month, um, and seasons as well. I want to look at options for packing school lunch specifically and give you both ideas about packing school lunches and also a toolkit for building the right um, and gathering the right materials to be successful there. And finally, I want to look at um, some pretty basic strategies to optimize nutritional status and nutritional support during the school year. That you know, our school year clearly aligns with um, exposure and uh, heightened exposure uh, to colds, flus, illness, um, and anything we can do to um, maximize and support our immune system and decrease um, the likelihood of infection and illness in this window of time um, is great. And I want to spend a little bit of time at the end of my talk today giving you some strategies to be successful there as well. So I want to take a few minutes before I move on to specifics and just let you know what my dietary assumptions are as I talk through this. And first and foremost, we want to look at providing ample water and making sure everyone's hydrated. Then, another assumption I make when I think about this is that all of our meals should really be coming from whole and unprocessed foods. So while you'll see some photos here uh, that I've shared with you that may have some processed foods in them, really my focus in building meals, meal plans, and snacks is all about real food um, that includes healthy carbohydrate sources and healthy fats. And I also want to talk briefly about probiotic-rich foods as a plus. Um, in the event that you are in that place where you're ready to expand your repertoire and add some other nutrient-dense meals and um, meal components, this is the next thing I would say could be a, a priority as you think through this. So first, let's talk about water. Uh, um, and we discuss this fairly frequently in our practice. Practice. Um, and I've just, ARI has just included an editorial in the recent newsletter and it's on the website now. It explains in detail uh, thoughts and our practice uh, as water as foundational nutrition really because it's one of the five with clients here. Typically we say, here are the caveats for us um, and the things that you, I guess, work around in the parameters for success when you think about including water in the diet. First, it's a box that I check when we talk about all the other important things our, should, our kids should be getting. Um, aim for one ounce per one pound of body weight for total fluid intake for your child each day. And initially, when we uh, establish that as our means of explaining to families what 
uh, our suggestion about water was I kind of felt like it was a fairly aggressive or assertive amount of water to suggest because there weren't a lot of guidelines for uh, hydration standards. In the past decade, we really have that now, and I talk a little bit about that in that editorial I mentioned, but we have guidelines about water, and this is actually a fairly easy way to align with what current hydration standards, and it's either the norm or less than some of the standards that are recommended at this time. So I'm still really comfortable saying if you have a 42-pound child, plan on getting 42 ounces of fluid into that child every day. If you have a 60-pound child, do the same. Plan on getting 60 ounces of water into that child every day. Other things that we think about are avoiding unfiltered water, fluoridated water is a big question mark in my mind, chlorinated water is a big question mark, and we typically still recommend that families think about choosing bottled water as an option, um, and I suggest that you look for a provider that can offer you that water in um, bottles rather than plastic, uh, because you don't really want to think about anything leaching from the bottling source into your water supply. Um, I also think that if you're buying bottled waters off the shelf, you can look for things like um, Mountain Valley Spring Water is now fairly wildly ava widely available. We look at a brand called San Faustino Mineral Water, which is effervescent to a certain extent, but not as bubbly as other uh, bubbly waters are out there, and that's a nice way to flavor with something natural and have your child drink water that is almost like a soda, um, but the carbonation in it is not so much that it's overwhelming for them. So really, think about water and make that the first thing on the list, and then think about protein. These are all sources of protein, um, and this is not my suggestion at all that we need to be uh, vegetarian or vegan in our approach here. Ideally local, know your source, organic if necessary, chicken, turkey, lamb, beef, bison, uh, pork, eggs, seeds, legumes, white beans, adzuki beans, lentils, split peas, all of those provide good options for protein throughout the day for our kids. What next? Uh, carbohydrates. And for me, the primary source for all of us really uh, should be freshly prepared, freshly uh, grown fruits and vegetables. So choose local and organic where you can. Uh, environmental working groups still tends to be the go-to place for current analysis of the cleanest vegetables in the commercial food supply and the ones you want to avoid. Uh, as well, and they are uh, kind of look at that on an annual basis and update those recommendations. So I would say um, if you don't have the ability to work with a local farmer so you, you know exactly what your exposure is, um, use the EWG information as a guide. Um, we know and research tells us that primarily, you know, if you can avoid those exposures, you should because the nutrient value is higher uh, in uh, foods that are grown without uh, a commercial process, really. There are documented levels of contamination. You support sustainable agriculture by supporting local small farms. So that's big picture, but small picture on an individual basis, the foods that we eat from um, um, this uh, macronutrient food group, as it were, that have this uh, wide range of color and um, uh, flavor and nutrient value uh, are, contain lots and lots of antioxidants that we don't really even understand fully yet. We know a lot, there's been a great deal of research out there on antioxidants and bioflavonoids that are found in um, produce, but uh, there's still a lot more to learn. And we know, um, that they play a role in cancer fighting and uh, tissue repair, um, in blood vessel integrity. So, uh, and I talk about this frequently, and that is I really feel like we need to be aiming for 9 to 13 servings of carbohydrates from vegetables and some fruits on a daily basis. Um, 
based on the research that we have and the current recommendations from the USDA. So this should be the core component of and the focus of the meals that we're planning, and that's what we'll talk about today. And I really, I know I just said this, but I really want to say it isn't novel information. We've known this for a while, and it isn't confined to autism spectrum issues alone. I mean, we know that more and more research focuses on the health benefits of a solely vegetable-driven diet. These are slowly catching on in the mainstream media, um, and not in a faddish or the next best thing way, but in a, yeah, we really need to be thinking about making our diet sources come from uh, things that are grown and things that are raised and not things that are created or preserved. So if you want other options, I always like to provide families with these references and resources. These are all studies coming from authors that look at this and take this issue seriously across disease syndrome disorder processes um, and provide simple recipes and easily understandable rationale for why this is the way to go. Uh, the next thing that we really want to look at from a macronutrient perspective is fat intake. And for children, fat intake should really be 30 to 40 percent of their total calorie consumption every day. Healthy animal fat, so there's nothing wrong with um, fat from beef or pork that has been safely raised uh, using tallow and lard, a great source of saturated fat. Nut and seed oils are a good source. Olive oil, avocado oil and also coconut oil are good options. And, and think about using a balance of saturated and unsaturated um, because these oils play a vital role in development for our children and I think that's understated in our current need to still talk through the remnants of um, low-fat diets or fat as a not great food source. And I think we're moving in the right direction and recognizing that it is a healthy option. But I feel like uh, for planning purposes, really think through including it as a huge chunk, so a third of what your child eats a day. The last thing that I mentioned in terms of probiotic or fermented foods, um, these are all sorts of homemade lacto-fermented fruits, uh, vegetables, uh, blends. Um, but there are, you know, sauerkraut, kimchi, uh, you can make kombucha, um, you can do any sort of culture for dairy or non-dairy uh, products such as kefir or yogurt that, uh, depending on what your family's belief about dairy products is. Um, and then any of these lacto-fermented vegetables either in a form like this or in a pickled form that would provide also those great uh, probiotic and prebiotic options would be a great thing to begin to introduce to your child's diet if you haven't done so already. So um, the first meal I really wanted to talk about in terms of our uh, webinar today and thinking through meal planning for the school year uh, is breakfast, obviously. And I, um, earlier last week when I was kind of finalizing things for this talk, I wanted nice images and I actually Googled healthy breakfasts, and this is actually one of the first images that popped up. Um, and this is not where I was going when I was thinking about healthy images, because after exploring this picture further in the post that it was linked to, I realized, okay, this doesn't have, this has a lot of things in it that we wouldn't want to eat. So it's humorous to me that this is actually linked somehow with healthy breakfast. Um, this is what a healthy breakfast, in terms of the parameters and guidelines that I've mentioned, um, should really look like. And, and just to walk through it with you, you're getting lots of carbs from the tomatoes, from the ingredients in that omelet. Um, there, are, it was prepared, assuming it was prepared with a healthy oil. Uh, you could also drizzle it with olive oil or avocado oil for additional fats at this point. Um, and then some carbs from the fruit juice that is in the background. And you need a balance of all of these things, clearly protein from the eggs and the omelet, carbohydrates from that fresh produce and all of those nutrients and micronutrients in addition to that, 
Um, and then hopefully some added fat as well through preparation of the omelet and maybe a drizzle on top or two as well. And that's what our breakfast should look like. You can make a rotation of things like this that include things like overnight oatmeal that you can serve with a healthy fat and some fruits and vegetables that you can get in there. You can do sautéed spinach with an egg over easy on top prepared in a nice oil. Um, and really think through and come up with options on a, a daily basis through the week and then plan it out. And I'm happy to share with anyone who's interested some of the examples of what that looks like for us so that um, you can be successful in thinking forward because I know we're not quite at the beginning of the school year yet, but it's always nice to have a plan in place as you move into it to decrease stress levels um, as you have to deal with um, the onslaught of things from the beginning of the school year. And I'm, I, you know, I can show you what different families do so that some families like a 30-day meal plan and will work through and do a different meal Monday through Friday for them. Some families like a weekly meal plan that they can use again and again and again, and we can do that. Um, but the idea really is to come up with options that you're comfortable with, your child will enjoy and will eat. Um, that meets the criteria for a healthy meal and um, use that repeatedly until you're ready from a seasonal perspective or a monthly perspective to move into another plan. So now let's talk about lunch. Um, not lunchables. I would um, think through what you can pack, one for your child that they will enjoy and eat and it will be healthy for them but also what will um, be accepted by their peers and not looked down upon or frowned upon necessarily because peer pressure really is huge in bringing uh, food to school and so you want to be careful and mindful of the impact of choices in that lunchbox and how it will impact your child. So I want to walk through a number of slides and give you just some ideas and overview of options for that and talk you through macronutrient options and how that breaks down in each of these and then give you the tools so show you where you can find things so that your equipment is ready to go at the beginning of the school year. So this um, really and what you'll see is missing um, is what you see is standard the chips and the processed bread and a sandwich and um, you have to try hard to get into the routine of packing things that exclude that, but it can include last night's leftovers. It can be, um, you know, something from breakfast. Some families, I had a family last year who would make a frittata on Sunday, and part of that frittata was served as lunch for some of the children throughout the week. So. So first, protein sources um, are covered here, and it could be last night's leftovers as the main course. And then you have a nice vegetable to dip in something on the left side, probably an energy uh, treat in the middle. And then from a veg vegetable perspective, you have the peppers, you have the lettuce, you have more protein with the eggs, and then you have a little bit of the fruit with the strawberries and grapes. Um, so that's just one option. Uh, another would be something like this where you're packing uh, a salami for protein, um, probably egg fried rice or something similar on the right that has a little bit of vegetable in it, a salad, tomatoes, and cherries. Another good healthy option. Um, here we have something that looks a little bit more traditional, so lettuce uh, wrapped uh, sandwich meat, carrots, kiwi, bell peppers, a little bit of cheese, uh, and crackers. Sushi, it's a beautiful meal. It's a little heavy on the fruit versus vegetable components for me, but all in all, it avoids all those processed things that we've talked about avoiding, uh, and I think it's a good healthy choice. Um, here's a chicken salad that includes a lot of really good vegetables as well as chicken um, that could be a gluten-free pasta in there. It could also be made with a rice component or a quinoa component or amaranth if you wanted to up the protein content, a nice mixed fruit salad, and then a little treat in the back. And 
finally, um, lean protein, uh, some uh, lettuce for vegetables, olives, cheese, and some berries. It's a nice, um, in terms of colorful variety, it's there, um, but it could be. Um, so those are really uh, options that show you this variety of things that you could do on a daily basis that's not so hard and not so far out of the norm, including things that you have at, at dinner um, the night before. Uh, all, all of those are ways to do this by stepping out of the sandwich chips, piece of fruit box. So what tools can help your success here? Um, I wanted to walk you through making choices for packing that lunch because um, I, I really see it as, uh, as twofold. One, making the game plan and having the equipment to put it in action. And so this um, is the handout that um, Tom and uh, Alyssa at uh, Whole Life Nutrition created years ago. And it's just so useful. We still continue to refer families to this just as something to print out and put on the fridge so that children who are learning or who want to help and are responsible for packing their own lunches have a, a visual in making themselves successful in that. And every family chooses different rules, so choose one food from each category is an option. Choose two vegetables and one fruit um, could be an option. Um, I, I, I just I can't say enough good things about this and other people have come out with options and people have wanted to update it but it's just so beautiful and so um, such a great website location there you can get there uh, and print out a copy of the PDF for yourself uh, and once you have that plan and uh, those options available as a parent you can use that to create your shopping list um, and create your meal plan. And your children can also reference it, both for packing lunches and also preparing any snacks. So let's talk now about the tools that we recommend families use to um, carry their things to school. First about water. There are lots of water bottles out there. We are um, some of the scary ones but you see still plastic water bottles, not BPA-free, um, that are you know are um, less than ideal for children to consume water from on a daily basis. So these are our top favorites. Um, in looking at, for information on water bottles last week, I realized that Clean Canteen has um, been named the water bottle of the year and the number of different sizes. Um, if you have a smaller child, you bottle, but I would encourage you to walk through filling it during the school day so that you're not getting um, a, a water supply in that bottle that you don't necessarily want your child consuming on a daily basis. Some of these are available uh, on Amazon or other national providers. And the others that I'll mention are typically under $20 for up to 24 ounces of water, um, uh, ability to carry up to 24 ounces of water. Another highly ranked brand is Hydroflask, and this is actually the one that we use in my household, not necessarily because uh, I feel like it's a better product or outweighs Clean Canteen and other um, factors. It's just that it comes in a size that's big enough for my teenagers to cart out of the house for sports practice and be able to consume um, during a two-hour soccer practice in the Texas heat. Uh, and typically that, you know, that's 48 ounces, I think. Uh, and it's insulated, so if I put cold water in it, it's going to be cold a few hours. Again, this is available at national retailers. It's available on Amazon. Lots of different colors, lots of different sizes. Fewer lid choices than the Clean Canteen version, but they are working on it. There also is an issue with that uh, wrap. Honestly, the, the lid that holds it to the container seems to be an issue, and you do have to be careful with that because it seems to break fairly easily. 
Having said all of that, we love ours and they're three years old and still in constant use. This is another bottle that's come out um, and seems to be very well designed for children specifically. It's very inexpensive. The most recent price that I found on it on um, Amazon last week was $13 a bottle, uh, which is for the quality and the reviews that we've read, it's an, a reasonable price given the one given the options out there and its competitors. It's a reasonably priced water bottle that will do the job well. Um, this I just wanted to mention because some families really like only glass bottles, um, and these are uh, wrapped and considered shatterproof glass. And the I've read the reviews on it now. Uh, again, available on Amazon, and they seem to be. Um, I, I think from a safety perspective, they seem to be safe for use even with younger children, but I would say this is a product I would use for children who understand the risks associated with um, carrying a glass water bottle around on a regular basis. Uh, this is um, a Camelback bottle. It's actually plastic. It, ha it, can, it holds 32 ounces. It holds up well in national studies, um, I guess, evaluations. People, several people have kind of looked at its leaching, and um, it's really Camelback's first foray away from the back, uh, you know, the water bottles for um, hiking, uh, biking, et cetera. Uh, but it seems to be getting good reviews. So that's another option, and it's fairly inexpensive as well. Talking now about lunch box options, um, there are four or five providers looking at for reusing lunch box, not packing in um, Ziploc plastic, not packing in um, Tupperware containers, but in, in looking at stainless steel and other safe materials, these are brands that we've tracked for several years now that seem to make a high quality product that are reusable. Um, so Lunchbox is one of them and you can find them easily on the web. They carry some of this model on Amazon, but not all. Um, there are lots of different shapes, so uh, they, the container can be very small, single serving. They can be up to, I think they have a, a, a one that's divided into three sections as well. They come with lots of silicone colors for the cover so you can mix and match. Um, and they wash well, they, they wear well. We've had several at my house for years now. And um, while the design of the cover seems to change over time, the product itself holds up really well and can be easily packed in lots of things and it doesn't leak in a lunch in a backpack or other bag. This is another option that's out there right now. It's called an Omi box um, and it really allows you to take cold food and hot food together in the same um, compartment. So for a stew or a pasta in the round component and then also include the salad and the berries, for example, or a drink if you need that. Um, I just love these because they're such beautiful lunches and really vegetables um, for success. So I, um, these are available not on Amazon but at some retailers and they tend to be a little bit pricier because of their, the technology I guess they're using to um, manage the hot and the cold. It could be worth it for some families. Um, this is uh, a planet box. Uh, these are, um, they're great in terms of ability to carry a lot of food into school on a day. Um, I think I, several of the pictures that I showed you earlier used this format. Uh, and in our house for our younger kids, we tended we tend to get two of these so that we have one in rotation to wash at the end of the day and pack for the next day. Um, price point is not inexpensive, but when you look at spending $40 on uh, something stainless that's last for three or four years now versus other options, I feel like it's been a good investment. Uh, they carry uh, components of this, but not the whole line on Amazon. 
and uh, planetbox.com is a great way to go because they also make, uh, uh, for the, the lids, they make each of those components that you see there on top of your child. You can order some that you switch them out on a daily basis if you like. Uh, you can have them customized so you can actually make uh, those fun for your child and I know families who've done that to, from a teaching perspective too, to be able to use that to teach what's in the lunchbox or a different story entirely, so that's another option as well. This is a laptop lunchbox and it was really one of the first um, alternative eco-friendly options available. This is the standard makeup for it, those four boxes that then fit into the lunchbox as a whole and then into the carrier. Um, this is safe plastic. There's information on their website that you can find to read up on that if you're curious. And I would, um, I would say it's a less costly investment than this one. It's easily just as um, durable because we have one in our house that's been around since preschool. Um, but when you get into a child who's six or older, so first grade or beyond, or if you have a young child who is a voracious eater, the serving sizes are small, honestly. So it's hard to get servings into this box for an older elementary child and feel like they're getting enough uh, to eat during their day. This is another option, it's called a Yum Box. Uh, it too, I showed you this picture earlier, um, it allows you to compartmentalize your foods and um, it seems to work well for people of all ages um, in terms of portion size. This one again is a little bit pricier. I believe it needs to be, um, it is, made outside the United States and there are only a few distributors here in the United States so far, so maybe it will be more available soon. Um, and then I just wanted to spend a few minutes looking at options for taking hot food or leftovers because we tend to um, overlook this as an opportunity. Um, I have one family that's dedicated to using a thermos every day and sends chicken broth or bone broth for their child with, um, with their meal and it's actually appreciated and enjoyed there in that setting at school for some reason. So I, I, I strongly encourage you to think through, even you know, in this 100 degree summer weather, um, options for sending warm food for your child to consume through the day too. And Thermos makes a good product. All of these that I'll run through are under $20 each. Their capacities vary. Um, there are typically, uh, they come down as small as an eight ounce container and they can go up as, you know. Um, but Thermos makes one. Lunchbox, the Lunchbox uh, maker that I mentioned earlier makes a good one. Hydro Flask makes a, it has just started this actually from a hot food perspective. I mean they do, there are other products do that, but this is a specific thermal um, thing for soups and stews which they've come out with, which is really kind of cute. Um, and also, so it ha comes in lots of colors and has kid appeal. It's inexpensive, if it's not the least expensive of this bunch, it's very close. Thermos comes in lots of different sizes and shapes as well, so if you want to mix it up, that's a good thing. Um, but I do think you need that in your toolkit because as a parent, it makes you, if you have something like that available, it helps to have something concrete to rotate, make you rotate it in on a regular basis. I want to talk about snacks just briefly, both in the context of what you should send in the morning to school and also uh, what you can have ready at the end of the school day. Uh, it's important, I think, we neglect to do this, and with most of the families that I work with, I say you need to talk to the school about this, and if it needs to be in a formalized setting, such as an IEP um, document, so be it, because we know our kids need food, and we need to respect that growing minds and bodies need to eat on a regular basis and not... Um, go through the, the wildly variable fluctuations in blood sugar and throughout the school day because that will decrease their academic and 
other performance. Uh, so it's important to me to talk families through, okay, let's plan out where your child is two to three hours, no more than three hours, after they finish their breakfast, whether that breakfast is at home or at school, on the way to school. Whatever that two to three hour time point is, where in that week that we're looking at for a snack. And a school snack should really, in that window, should have a few basic components, a little bit of protein, some fat, and some carbs. And that can look like this trail mix. It could be a banana with peanut butter or almond butter or sun butter. It could be a little bit of dried fruit with, um, you know, a packet of raisins and pumpkin seeds. Whatever that little snack is, you want something that will provide balance blood sugar short term and long term and to do that you need to make sure you're thinking about getting um, each of those ends. In the afternoon, ignore the M&Ms in the bag on the right, but think through what you need um, in the car when you're picking your child up or what needs to be on the table when your child walks in the door. And it could look something like this. So have a box or a bag or a basket that's ready to go that they, with the knowledge that if they choose the strawberries, they also need to be choosing something else and the rules are the same. Because ideally, dinner is going to be about two hours from the time the snack is consumed. And this snack will help um, decrease the afternoon prankies that are associated with long gaps in um, food intake, and also coupled with a very long school and therapy day. This is just another option, small bags of trail mix, some fresh fruit, some hummus for protein. Um, all of those things could be helpful and useful. I just wanted to touch on dinner briefly, and the only thing I want to say about dinner really is that there are lots of webinars out there both on the autism.com website and also on the Johnson Center website um, and really planning forward as your schedules are going to be increasing dramatically six weeks from now in all likelihood and you really want to start thinking about planning in advance for that so that um, that can be somewhat seamless as well. And I want to spend the last few minutes that we have today um, talking about what to do in cold and flu season. Your child's going back to school, goes to a lot of <clears throat> bacteria, viruses, things that go uh, in a uh, exposure to other children who have been exposed in other environments. So what do you do and what can you do to prepare your child and your family to minimize the impact of those germs? Um, <clears throat> on him or her and on you. Really the focus is on habits first, so provide good food. Um, think through all of those things that we've just talked about in terms of food planning and really understand and recognize that that's the foundation for good immune system support. Um, focus on sleep get into um, a routine both for your child and respect that routine both for your child and for the other family members in the home. Plan on exercise. Often during the summer we're out, we're running, um, we spend more time outside whether it's at the pool or on vacation and really think through where that exercise is going to come from. Um, during the school year. Will it be an after school activity? Will it be during school time? Just make sure that you're thinking about exercise needs and the need to move your body as well as your child's um, and plan forward for that. Uh, practice good hygiene, not overboard hygiene, so that we're killing lots of different things unnecessarily, but hand washing is always a good bet. Uh, it doesn't have to be the heavy duty commercial strength um, antibacterial soap that we all know to be respectful of and stay away from if we can, but it does really need to include washing your hands at the appropriate times, particularly before meal prep, before eating a meal, um, so that you minimize any exposure that way. Finally, think through minimizing and managing and figuring out ways to cope with stressors that will inevitably come upon us 
as we enter the school year, both as parents and also for our students, um, and have a strategy to deal with that. So teach coping mechanisms to your child and also enact those for yourself. Um, and that'll lay the groundwork for um, a healthy start to a vulnerable season. And then what do we do? There are some real basics. I mean, this is a, a topic in itself, and there are several webinars out there on immune support as well. But um, the safe basics that you can think about doing, if only through the school year, would be augmenting your dietary intake of vegetables and fruits if your child is not consuming 9 to 13 vegetables a day. Um, adding a whole food support product would be a great option here because you will be getting those phytonutrients that we've talked about playing a key role here um, and a lot of other things too that we don't know about yet but those come in a variety of forms capsules or powders are probably best um, but you can also find them in gummies and other chewables if you must go that route look for something that's healthy and doesn't carry a lot of added sugar in either form uh, good manufacturers to explore would be Designs for Health, um, Metagenics, um, Thinking Through Vital Nutrients, Juice Plus. All of those make a, a whole food supplement that would be um, practitioner level quality and provide the additional phytonutrient support. Um, I like to have one on board throughout the year, but particularly in the fall and winter, it's a good idea. Other nutrients to think about are zinc, because we know zinc plays a huge role in immune status and immune support. So if your child is on a multivitamin and taking a multivitamin, just confirm that they're getting adequate zinc to meet their um, meet RDA at minimum. Sometimes zinc can be uh, uh, supported at greater levels and sometimes zinc deficiencies can be, um, I guess, not um, easily recognized by traditional practitioners. So testing with um, a practitioner if you want to give additional support might be a good idea. Uh, but that's just a nutrient to think about. You've seen those zinc lozenges that are out there when you have a sore throat. That There are mixed uh, results in research studies on that, but we do know if your body has an adequate zinc supply, it does help your body's immune system function to its abilities, which is important in this time of year. Another nutrient you want to play, pay close attention to would be vitamin D. Uh, it has um, an active role in our immune systems and other things as well. Uh, it's something that you can easily check for yourself and your pediatrician can check for your child. You want to make sure your child's numbers are in the, um, in the range of adequate at minimum, uh, which for us would be at least um, 40 ng ml. Um, and many of the children we work with, despite it being summertime and despite a lot of outdoor activity in the south of the U.S., um, still have deficient vitamin D levels. Um, supplements are easy to come by. It's fairly inexpensive. And uh, dosages can be guided by your pediatrician in response to those test results. In terms of cold and flu treatment and prevention. Uh, this is something that has been used for years in Europe and other countries. It's something that we have um, made available to and talked to our clients about. Uh, it can be used both for prevention and also treatment. Um, and it's now readily available in the U.S. with the caveat and the clear statement that it's not a flu treatment because it's a homeopathic remedy um, or medicine. Uh, there is some controversy out there about that, but it's something that I feel comfortable talking to people that I work with about because if you read the data on its use, um, I'm comfortable with that. Other options include um, Sambucol, when you're talking about a cold that comes in both a standard form and also a cold and flu form for nighttime so that um, it provides a little bit more support for nighttime coughing. 
um, and some components for sleeplessness to help your body relax. All homeopathic, um, very safe, and it's something that we have used. It's been researched um, that we've used for some time without in the past 15 years. Uh, two other options in terms of treatment would be uh, Highlands Defend, which is available widely now here. These are just packets that you can make into tea um, that seem to be helpful in minimizing symptoms. And also Chestol, which is a honey homeopathic cough medicine, which um, we have good results with as well. Some of the options uh, that you can use both to be in a good place going into cold and flu season and also some basics for helping minimize response and discomfort if you happen to get a cold or flu. Um, and I think that's really all that I have time to cover today. Uh, I'm happy to take a few questions now if there's any time remaining. Okay, great. Uh, we did get some questions. One of the first questions we had was from a parent asking, 9 to 13 servings, great. We know why, but we just can't get it in. We literally cannot get it inside of our child. Barely two to three servings a day. I know many other parents have a hard time with this too. And I know I've, I got some emails from parents who said, my child's lunchbox comes back from school with food still in it. Um, lunchtime is the, sort of the dead time when teachers and attendants aren't really responsible to make them eat. So they're asking questions about how to, if you've seen anybody successfully navigate that or if they've used IEPs or what they've done to try to get food in during the day? Uh, number one, first I think we need to remember what serving sizes for kids are because when families, you know, uh, are just astounded when I say aim for nine servings a day, um, they quickly kind of back off of that when I help them realize that when I'm saying to you a serving for a child can often be two tablespoons of something. Um, so automatically it makes it a more attainable goal if we start thinking about serving children's serving sizes adequately um, rather than what we have in our heads or what our vision of a serving of any given thing is. Right? And truly, that's like half of an apple or three strawberries or six baby carrots. In terms of packing foods for school and then having them consumed, I, I would say it's always good to pack things for school that you've introduced and have been accepted at home before. It's also interesting too, and what we've had good results with, is incentivizing the child to try things at school, uh, depending on what sort of oversight there is, because you know you do have the child who will sneak it into the trash can at the end of the lunch period. But you know, having the talking the child through it, sending you know um, re uh, some sort of positive reinforcement along, allowing. Um, the child to provide feedback and having that be an open conversation really about what they like and what they don't like. And if you can get to even a handful or two of vegetables primarily that kids will enjoy, it's okay not to rotate through those on a regular basis, though ideally you want to be providing vegetables that really are across, you know, lots of different colors and, and um, color density really. Um, and I think, you know, the other thing that uh, it comes to mind is we can bury those vegetables in other foods too. So if you have a child that likes pasta sauce, we can bury pureed zucchini and spinach in that. And I think we need to remember that if we have to be sneaky about it, that's another option to get it in there, either short term until they develop a love for it themselves or longer term if necessary. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. A parent was asking about RDA requirements. So uh, she's apparently read about the nutritional differences in kids on the spectrum and wondered if, if we should follow the RDA or if maybe there's a slightly different uh, guidance. Um, first and foremost, I would say RDA is the bare minimum for any of us. What do we need to function? not to function at our best and certain, you know, and different people have different 
nutrient needs at any given time and really needs to be driven by individualized data collection. The dietary analysis can give you a good idea about increasing nutrients on a case-by-case -case basis. But <clears throat> um, there is no, okay, what do we know to be everyone's deficits and therefore what is their requirement information out there yet? So really I would say start with a multivitamin and then work with a clinician who can help you figure out what nutrient needs are on a case-by-case -case basis.